My name is Amanda Thomas and I will be your host this evening and I'd love to welcome you to our first Science on Tap online. And tonight we're going to be talking about Music and the Anxious Brain, an online presentation and concert with Dr. Larry Sherman, who is a neuroscientist at OHSU. And Larry's been a longtime friend of Science on Tap and has given a number of per, uh, performances or presentations with us, uh, notably on neuro, uh, the neuroscience of pleasure and love and music and the aging brain. And we figured that this is probably a good time to mix that up a little bit and talk about music and the anxious brain, since many of us may be feeling that particular emotion at the moment. Um, and we hope that we can come away from this evening with a better understanding of how our brains work and how music can help with the stress that we're all dealing with. So um, hopefully you find that useful. Um, for those of you who are new to Science on Tap, I realize that there are probably some of you who have been to our events in the past, um, but maybe some are of you who are new. And um, what you should know is that we have been running Science on Tap in Portland, Oregon and Vancouver, Washington for um, about seven years or so. And um, the, the point is that we want to make science accessible to adults in particular. Um, and so one of the ways that we do that is we hold our events in these really wonderful theaters that we work in in Portland and Vancouver, uh, the Alberta Rose Theater mostly and uh, in Portland and the Kiggins Theater in Vancouver. And those theaters have food and, and beverages available. And so folks can come in and have a pint of, of beer or a glass of wine and, and listen to somebody a scientist talk about science. And it's a fun event. And so I, I encourage you, if you haven't already, to um, have a, uh, an adult beverage, perhaps, um, or any kind of beverage uh, next to you as you enjoy this event this evening. And I realize that there may be some kids watching this evening, so um, have whatever drink is appropriate for you. Uh, we plan to have these events, these online Science on Tap events, every Thursday evening in April and May. And if you go to our Facebook page or join our mailing list or um, visit our website, um, you can find out some more about the upcoming events. We have one next week on uh, oxytocin, and we have another one coming up um, soon on bird watching, which may become very relevant to a lot of people looking at our windows. Um, so. Uh, we hope that you will join us for those events as well. Um, we will be recording or we are recording this event uh, this evening. So if um, Facebook doesn't end up cooperating, we will be able to post this um, fairly soon after the event. Um, we are also working with fingers be able to uh, make a version of this that has ASL interpretation uh, along with the presentation um, so that we can uh, be more inclusive in, in how we're presenting this information. So keep an eye out for that. That will take a couple of days to produce, but we'll have that out as soon as we can. Um, and hold on just a moment. Um, oh, apparently Facebook and Zoom had a disagreement today and no longer allows Zoom to live stream on business pages. So that's the problem. Um, we'll get that figured out. Sorry, we did test this out many times in, in advance, so sorry about that. Um, so what you can expect tonight is, um, we started a few minutes late, but um, the presentation will uh, last about an hour. Um, and uh, for those of you who are regulars, want to let you know, sorry, we're not going to be doing trivia tonight. We couldn't figure out a way to do trivia that wasn't awkward when we can't actually see each other. So um, if you have an idea for how to do that in the future, please get in touch with us because we would love to engage with folks on that. Um, and, and so we're open to ideas on that. Um, and I'll introduce our speaker here in just a minute. Um, he'll talk to around 8 p.m. and then we'll have time for some questions afterward. And Related to those questions, um, some of this information apparently is is not relevant anymore. Um, but if you are on Zoom, presumably, uh, presumably, sorry, um, you can ask questions through um, the Q and A feature on Zoom. Um, we will have somebody monitoring the Q and A and the chat features on there. So if you have questions. Go ahead and submit those. We have a couple of folks who will be monitoring those channels and then we'll be feeding those questions to me so that I can um, ask those questions of Larry once he's finished presenting. So um, 
we hope to be finished by pro with the Q&A and everything by about 8.15 p.m. So um, Pacific, obviously. Um, so that's what you can expect. Um, we will also have a survey that we want to send out to everyone afterwards. So um, all the folks who have signed in through Zoom, we will uh, be sending you a link to a survey so that we can get your feedback on what we've done right and, and what we can do better for next time. Um, and we will also be posting it on our Facebook page and, and sending it out through various other media. So we'd appreciate your feedback on that. So with that, I'm going to stop my slide share and welcome Dr. Larry Sherman to the stage. Well, hi, Amanda. And hi, everybody else. Uh, this is Science on Tap. And uh, here's a little product placement for you. This is a Science on Tap mug, which you could have won uh, if this was a live event. So everybody who has a drink, cheers. Mm. Ah, that's good. Ah, man. So um, uh, as you heard, I'm, I'm Larry Sherman. I'm a professor at the Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, Oregon. Uh, I'm a neuroscientist. Uh, my day job is spent actually trying to figure out ways to fix damaged brains in people with multiple sclerosis and Alzheimer's and other types of diseases. Um, and that's an interesting topic on its own. Maybe we'll come back and do those, one of those on uh, Thursday night. Um, but I'm also the president of the Society for Neuroscience for the state of Oregon uh, and for Southwest Washington. And as such, I like to give public talks to get people excited about neuroscience. Um, and this is one of them. So unfortunately, although I am going to be talking about some things that I study uh, during the course of the evening in my own laboratory, I am not a, uh, somebody who actually studies the neuroscience of music in my lab. Um, what I've done is really gone through the literature and found some exciting uh, points that I wanted to share with you that I am convinced by as a skeptical neuroscientist, uh, but that's, that's not what I do. Um, having said that, um, uh, I think some of you saw on the link that um, there's a way to contribute to this. I know you don't have to pay for these events, but um, uh, the people at Science and Tap do a wonderful job here, and like everybody else, they're, they're hurting. So I hope you'll consider uh, giving whatever you can, $1, uh, $10, a million dollars would be great. So, um, so thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna start just by um, playing a little music here. Uh, and while I'm playing, uh, there'll be some quotes from people who are a lot smarter than me uh, about this topic, some very profound quotes. So I hope you enjoy that. with all these things the uh, technical issues have to be worked out and uh, one of those technical issues is sometimes my remote is working and sometimes it's not um, 
I always like to talk about definitions at the beginning of these presentations. And the reason for that is that if we don't understand each other, it makes it kind of hard to be understanding of each other. And a great story to kind of illustrate that point uh, comes from uh, little Mary Catherine. Now, little, little Mary Catherine um, was going to Sunday school one day, and the nuns were covering the Ten Commandments. And they were going through all the different commandments, which I suspect most of us have already heard of one, one time or another. Um, and then they got to this one commandment um, that she was a little confused about, and it was about adultery. And she had never heard that word before. And when she asked the nun to explain what that is, um, she just kind of said, listen, you know, it's an adult thing. You don't have to really worry about that right now. And so um, what she said was, uh, why, don't we, uh, why don't we just not worry about that now? And she went on home and uh, she, uh, what, what's happening here? Oh, thank you. Yeah, there's a cursor there. So, so Mary Catherine went home and she decided to uh, think about this for a while. And then her brother had a temper tantrum. Her little brother had a temper tantrum. And uh, she decided to give her little brother her favorite toy. Uh, and that calmed him down. And her parents were so uh, you know, praising of her. She thought, you know, this might be my chance to become the favorite child. She always wanted to be the favorite child. So she decided to keep on doing this over and over again and kept on getting praise. Um, and a few nights went by. And, and at this dinner table one night, they just said, you know, Mary Catherine, that's very adult of you. And she got a little nervous about that because they thought maybe she, they were onto her, right? They knew that she had this scheme going on. And then she heard the word adult and thought, oh, what the nuns said. Maybe this is what the nuns were talking about. So she went and had her next confession, or one of her first ever confessions. Um, and when the priest asked her, so do you have anything to confess? Um, little Mary Catherine says very loudly so that everybody could hear, I committed adultery seven times. Well, the priest was, of course, a little shocked by this. Um, her friends, however, were thrilled, and they thought she was awesome. And the nuns had a very different opinion of Mary Catherine from that day forward. This is why we have to have strong definitions for all the things that we talk about. So coming back to neuroscience, uh, what you see in this picture is a slice from a brain. And this was a slice made by Golgi. Golgi um, discovered so many things, but this was actually done before he was famous. Um, and he, when he really was getting started, he just had this little space. He didn't really have a laboratory at all. And apparently the story goes that he would come home from all of his duties at the university in Padua, um, and he would uh, make these slices of brains um, that he kept next to the pasta and all the stuff for the sauces. And on the other side was a, a bunch of big collection of chemicals that were very toxic. So he'd make himself some dinner, He'd lay down a slice of brain and he'd start adding these toxic chemicals. And one day he found one that labeled the entirety of a nerve cell, a neuron. And that's what you see here. Um, neurons are really amazing cells. They have this unique structure that's really different from other types of cells. So what you see in this picture, this diagram, um, the thing in the middle there with that big uh, black dot, that's the cell nucleus, which all cells have, except for cells that don't have nuclei. Um, but coming off of it are these branches, and those are called dendrites. And those branches can be very simple, they can be very uh, long, they can be very short, or very heavily branched, very complicated. Um, and that's where electrical signals enter the cell. And then going down the cell, you can see the little long string called the axon. Um, that's where the signal continues uh, onto other places where it branches off. And axons can also be very short or very, very long. In fact, some of them can go almost the length of your spinal cord, which is one single cell. It's a very long distance for it to travel. And then surrounding some of those axons is a yellowish substance called myelin. Now, myelin, um, this is an actual electron micrograph. So this is uh, magnified like 40,000 times, I think. And what you're looking at is in the middle of that picture, that is a circle with tiny little circles in the middle. That's actually the axon. You're looking down the barrel of the axon. And then that beautiful material going around and around that axon, that's the myelin. And the myelin isn't made by the axon, it's actually made by another cell. And the arrow there in that picture is pointing to a little tiny piece of that cell. And these are cells that we actually study in my laboratory. And this is actually a picture from my laboratory. That is an oligodendrocyte. Don't worry, there won't be a test later. But this particular uh, picture 
shows in the middle the cell body, that's where the cell nucleus is, but it also has these incredible, beautiful branches. And what's amazing is each one of those branches can wrap around a segment of an axon and form myelin. So one oligodendrocyte can make myelin for many different axons. Now, what is myelin good for? Well, as you probably all know, most things in science are named after something in Greek, something in Latin, or they're named after some dead guy. Well, this is an example of something named after a dead guy. Um, this is the node Ranvier. And what Ranvier discovered was there were these interruptions, those little yellow blips there um, in myelin along axons. And those interruptions allow for something called saltatory conduction. So basically, if you have myelin, um, it's like driving on the Autobahn at, at midnight where there's no speed limit. You can be going 200 miles an hour and no one's gonna stop you. But if you lose that myelin and lose that saltatory conduction, it's like driving on Highway 5 here in Portland at rush hour by the 84 interchange. You'll be lucky to be going two miles an hour. So myelin really increases the speed at which electrical impulses travel um, through nerve cells, the neurons. Now, another really interesting cell in our brain, and it's only really in the last 20 or 30 years that people have come to appreciate how important these cells are, is the astrocyte, the star cell. Um, and this is another picture from uh, a graduate student of mine uh, in my laboratory, Marty Preston. The blue dots are the cell nuclei, and these red extensions, again, are these uh, cells that lay out these beautiful, sort of interesting architectures that look like starfish, I think, a little bit. Um, and these cells have a lot of different functions. They're first responders to brain injury. They also uh, play an important role in regulating um, the, uh, the functioning, the connections between uh, neurons. Um, and um, they also interact with the blood vessels. So they can actually help regulate um, blood flow as demanded by neurons when they need to fire. And we'll talk about that more a little, a little bit later. Now, most of us have more than one neuron, uh, most of us. And uh, what you see in this picture is a cartoon of a dendrite with all these axons making connections with them. And there are electrical synapses, but there are also these chemical synapses. And what you're seeing here are connections, the yellow things are those axons coming from other cells and synapsing with uh, portions of these dendrites, these little branches. Now, what's remarkable is, is the fact that some of these are chemical synapses, or quite a few of them are, and what you're seeing here is a cartoon, uh, an animation showing uh, axon firing and then what you're seeing at the bottom of the screen is a dendrite and coming in in the middle there, that's an axon. And there's a space between the two and there's stuff being released in that space. And that stuff um, are, are these are chemical messengers called neurotransmitters. So what happens is the axon on the left there actually releases these, they're so-called vesicles, they're little balls that contain these neurotransmitters. When, they, when it fires, it's released into the space between the axon and the dendrite. And then it is taken up by proteins on the dendrite side, and then the neurotransmitters are released and cause the dendrite to fire. Now the amount of neurotransmitter that's in that tiny little space has to be tightly regulated. And in fact, a lot of the things we're gonna be talking about tonight, for example, anxiety, can, if you have chronic anxiety uh, disorders, for example, a lot of the things that go wrong are happening in that space. Um, one of the molecules that goes in there, for example, is serotonin. And one of the things that we've been using to treat certain types of anxiety and depression are serotonin reuptake inhibitors because they help change the balance of the serotonin um, in that space. So how do we get these three things, the neurons, the astrocytes, um, and the myelination? Well, we've known for some time that there's a process called neurogenesis, the creation of neurons, and gliogenesis, the creation of glial cells. And oligodendrocytes and astrocytes were long just described collectively as glial cells and still are. And what you see in this picture are actually newborn neurons um, coming from uh, populations of cells called neural stem cells, which are basically cells in the brain that just haven't decided what they're gonna be when they grow up yet. And so those cells are now projecting out dendrites and axons and forming new circuits. Then you have to form myelin for some of those axons and what you see in this picture in the middle is a yellow cell, that's an oligodendrocyte, and it's projecting myelin out to all those nearby axons. And then finally, we have to connect those new neurons up, and that's the process of synaptogenesis, the genesis or creation of synapses. And what you see in that picture and is a big yellow neuron with lots of blue dots, and the blue dots are synapses. 
So there's, I mentioned these neurotransmitters, and this is gonna be really important for what we're talking about tonight because there are many different neurotransmitters. I'm just gonna talk about three tonight, um, but there's many others. But the three I wanna talk about include one many of you may have heard of, called, one's called dopamine. And dopamine has a lot of different functions. It can influence reward signaling and motivation. Um, another one is serotonin, which I just mentioned. And serotonin has a lot of different functions as well. It can influence compulsion and sleep and memory. And then another one is norepinephrine or noradrenaline, some people call it. Um, and that can influence energy and alertness. But when they're together, uh, functionally, they can have different effects. And when all three of them come together, one of the things we know that they're very closely involved with is mood. And a mood of a human being or an animal or any organism can be affected really uh, by this balance of neurotransmitters in response to different types of stimuli. And one of the stimuli is fear. Now, fear is really, if you, by definition, it's just an unpleasant emotion caused by the idea that something is dangerous. Something might kill you or cause you harm or somehow a threat. Um, and Darwin said it best. He said, fear is an adaptive response. Think about it. If we learn that something's dangerous, we fear it and we avoid it. Um, having said that, of course, uh, there are people who don't quite get that. Um, there is this thing called the Darwin Awards for people who don't quite get that. And a lot of those people started their adventures with the expression, hold my beer and watch this. Now, um, the question though is how much fear is learned? And this was a question that was posed by many different people. And we have to kind of go back to questions about something called classical conditioning to understand that. So this was Pavlov. And you may have heard of Pavlov and his dogs who drooled a lot. Um, so Pavlov, as it turns out, um, he noticed one day that um, he had these dogs that were living in kennels, and he noticed one day that the fellow who always brought them their food, uh, they of course drooled when they saw the food, but he also realized that when he came in even without food, they still drooled because they saw him as the source of food. And he thought, hmm, I wonder if I could pair something other than a person uh, to cause them to have this response. And so what you see at the top two panels there is the dog and he's looking at the food uh, and he's drooling and he's hearing a bell and he's not drooling. Well, that's pretty normal for a dog. A dog that would drool just off the bat when you ring a bell would be a problem. But this dog, of course, didn't. And so then what Pavlov did, did was every time he brought food to the dog, he would ring a bell. And after a time, what would happen was all he had to do was ring the bell and then the dog would start drooling. So this was really a, um, a fantastic discovery in, in the world of uh, behavioral neuroscience, which was uh, in its infancy at the time, of course. Um, and somebody asked the question, what about humans? And that is a question that we're going to get into uh, because this experiment that was done was, would never have been allowed to be done today. So let's go over this really quickly because in the Pavlov experiment, what you had were a neutral stimulus, which was the bell. A neutral stimulus is just something that you don't expect to cause whatever behavior you're looking for. And then you had the unconditioned stimulus, which was the food, the stimulus that you think would cause drooling in this case. Now you have the unconditioned response, which is salivating. So the bell shouldn't cause that. But then you do conditioning, and now you have the conditioned stimulus, which is the bell paired with the food. And then you have the conditioned response, which eventually means salivating when the bell comes in. So there was a a fellow named John Watson and his graduate student, Rosalie Rayner, who in 1920 decided to test this in a human baby. Uh, this was called the Little Albert Experiment. And there's quite a bit of controversy about it for a number of reasons. One, it had a sample size of one. Uh, two, uh, no one's really sure how they got a hold of this baby. Um, there are many different stories out there. And three, nobody really knows what happened to Albert. There's been several people who claim to have tracked down Albert and uh, maybe one of these people was Albert, but no one's entirely 100% sure. Nonetheless, what they decided to do with Albert was um, present him with um, fuzzy creatures. They would present him with a dog or a rabbit or a rat. Um, and of course, he wasn't afraid of these things because they were new to him and he was curious about them. Um, and then they decided to use something that all baby, babies experience, which is the startle response. So they would hit a um, steel, uh, bar with a hammer and cause the baby to startle and cry. So we have the rat um, and we have the, the, the response that you expect, uh, which is crying in response to the startle. 
So then what they did was they brought the rat in and every time they brought the rat in, they would hit the, the, the bar and cause a struggle response and cause little Albert or whatever his name was to cry. And after a short while, um, he became fearful of the rat without any bars being hit. Um, so the conditioned stimulus now and the conditioned response were achieved. So what's happening here is a fearful response. Um, and when we learn to fear things, uh, we learn these responses to the fearful item. Now, what happens when we have fear often is we have what's called the freeze, fight, or flight response. Now, when I was learning about this, it was always some person hanging out, walking along like this person here, and then walking into a cave. And then they would turn around and there would be this vicious, mean, horrible, ugly bear, kind of like this one right here. <laughs> um, and the, the bear, of course, uh, gave you this choice. I'm either going to freeze, which is a, a natural response to fear. I'm going to fight this bear, which is a really bad idea, by the way. Or I'm going to run as fast as I can away from this bear. bear. So what's happening in the brain under those conditions? So this is a side view of one of the hemispheres of the human brain. And I'm going to more or less show you a circuit um, that is involved in this process. It's not every part of the brain that I'm going to show you, but just the major parts. So you've got your stimulus, which is the evil bear. There it is. Um, and that's going to now turn on a part of our brain called the amygdala. Now, the amygdala does a lot of different things, but one of the things the amygdala does is kind of respond to threats. Um, and so the amygdala then is going to um, actually send its cells within the amygdala, different parts of the amygdala, to other parts of the brain, including uh, something called the PAG, the periaqueductal gray area there, the gray part, which is just around the cerebral aqueducts, the part of the brain that carries uh, cerebrospinal fluid to other parts of the brain, and another part of the brain called the hypothalamus. Now what's gonna happen then is um, the periaqueductal gray is gonna become activated both by signals coming from the hypothalamus as well as the periaqueductal gray amygdala connection and it can cause the freezing response or in another part of the periaqueductal gray, depending on where you're getting activation with help from the hypothalamus, either the fight or the flight response. Um, now this is uh, kind of what you're setting up for this behavior, but there's other parts of the brain um, where um, you actually can then get projections from the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland, which is a little stalk hanging down below the brain. It's encased in bone, and that releases hormones into our circulatory system and throughout our bodies. So that's a response that is part of the stress response that affects the rest of the body, influencing your muscles, influencing heart rate, and all sorts of other things. Now, in addition to that, it turns out other parts of our brain can kind of regulate this whole response. Um, and kind of tampen down the threats, for example, or change our re reaction to the threats, or even change that decision between freezing and fighting or, or fleeing. Um, and those areas include this blue area on top, the anterior cingulate cortex, or the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. Now, the hypothalamus, when it activates the pituitary, what, one of the things it does is it releases something called corticotropin releasing hormone, which then activates the pituitary to release another hormone, adrenal tropic hormone or ACTH, and that actually signals down to your adrenal glands, which are the little glands on top of your kidneys, and they release a stress hormone called cortisol. Now, the whole idea here is that cortisol is supposed to be released. It's supposed to kind of help set you up for that fight or flight response, um, and then it's supposed to go away. But if you have chronic stress, your cortisol levels will stay chronically high, um, and that can actually do a lot of damage both to your body and to your brain. Um, and so the most important thing is to kind of get that stress under control so your cortisol levels don't stay high for a very long time. So that brings us back to this question about fear. So if you learn this fearful thing that you really don't need to be afraid of, and it's not gonna mean you're gonna be eaten by a bear, but maybe there's some other stress that you're having that maybe you wanna get over uh, that's not gonna really be harmful for you in the long run, can you reverse fear conditioning? Well. Um, a lot of work was done subsequent to the Little Albert experiment. Sadly, Little Albert himself never experienced this as far as we know. But studies subsequent to that show that there's a process called fear extinction. So over time, if you keep seeing the rat and you don't hear the startling sound, um, you change your memory of the rat. And then Little Albert feels better. All right. 
Another possibility, and this is also the basis of quite a few cognitive behavioral therapies today, is you can use conditioning to recondition uh, the experience of the rat. So if instead of just the rat, maybe you add a cookie to the, to the deal. Every time you bring a rat into the room, Albert gets a cookie. And over time, now getting the impression of the rat means getting a cookie and that changes the memory of the rat as well. So one of the things we wanna to ask tonight is, um, say little Albert was uh, living at a time when there was a pandemic that was scaring the, the Jesus out of everybody, um, could something like music help overcome the stress and fear that's generated from that experience? So coming back to definitions, the question is, what is music? There's a lot of ideas about this. Um, my favorite definition is this one, that it's organized sound. That's very poetic, but I'm a neuroscientist, and not a poet, so um, we're gonna go with a different uh, definition, which is that music is the organized vibrations of air molecules, the same ones Frank Zappa mentioned at the beginning of the talk, converted into specific signals by the brain. And that's really what all sound is. It's air molecules changing the way they vibrate in space, moving through the air, and entering your, your, your ear and your auditory cortex and stimulating your memory for those sounds. Where did music come from? Well, there's a lot of theories about that, of course. One is that it was a uh, early form of communication. In fact, think about um, the lyrics to a, a poem or the, the, the words to a poem that you haven't thought about in about 15 years. Um, they may come back to you if you have a really good memory, but then think about uh, any song that you've thought about 15 years, you learned about 15 years ago that you really liked, and as soon as you start singing them, the lyrics come back. And there's a lot of examples of, of this in our culture, and that's a really powerful way. It's an information-rich system, and so people, of course, use music to transfer information. Um, it certainly has evolved music through a religious practice throughout the world. Um, religions everywhere use music to spread the messages of the religion, um, and that's an important social aspect of how music changed over time and evolved uh, to what it is today. And then there's this idea. Um, and the idea was, of course, that, um, you know, back when we were starting to come out of caves and become more specialized, uh, we had people who were, you know, leaders and hunters that uh, were coming, becoming sort of professional hunters within the group. Um, and you had this other group of people who were sitting around making music all day. And somehow they had clothing and food covered, and that made them really attractive. Um, and that may explain certainly why some musicians are considered sex symbols. That worked for Elvis, but, you know, it might have worked for Beethoven, too. Now, I have my own favorite uh, theory, uh, and this is actually based on a comedy routine from Mel Brooks and Carl Reiner called The 2,000-Year-Old Man. And in this uh, comedy routine, Carl Reiner was the interviewer, and Mel Brooks was the 2,000-year-old man, and he would ask questions like, where did music come from? And the 2,000-year-old man said, well, music came out of fear. And he says, fear? Yes. He says, one day I was out walking, and a lion started eating my foot off. And so he called out, a lion is eating my foot off. Somebody call a cop. And people heard that from all around and liked what they heard so much, they started singing along. And before long, everybody was in on it. Now, I like this theory as good as any. I, I think it's fine. It works for me. Um, but in reality, if we look back into antiquity, there's examples of music everywhere. These are cave etchings and, and uh, shards of vases and everything else. They all have flutes, you may notice. Flutes were durable instruments. Uh, and in fact, we've seen in cave diggings uh, evidence of flute in all cultures almost. Uh, and what's remarkable is some of them date back pretty far, like this one here. Um, this was um, in the Aachen Valley in Ulm, Germany. Uh, and these are uh, the wing bones of an extinct species of vulture. Uh, and they've been dated at 35,000 years ago. So this is really quite early in human history. These are homo sapien caves. That's us, we are homo sapiens. Um, and that was really remarkable. Now, something else that was remarkable was this finding. So this is, um, was actually back in 1996 in a, a cave in Slovenia. Um, and this cave had no evidence of any contamination by homo sapiens. Now, maybe some of you know this, but homo sapiens and Neanderthals got together uh, and in fact, they were mating, uh, and some people have up to 6% uh, Neanderthal DNA. Some have more than others, if you know what I mean. 
Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, in fact, this particular cave had no evidence of, of any Homo sapiens coming around. And uh, yet they found this. Now this is a, a femur from an extinct species of bear, a juvenile bear. And what you see are there's some very beautiful clean holes. And then on either end, there are fragments of holes. The bone on the left side was crushed. On the right side, it was just uh, ha cut in half. Um, and those holes were assumed to be made by predators, even though they're so clean. The problem I have with that theory is one, most predators have upper teeth and lower teeth. Um, but uh, there was no evidence of any markings on the other side of that bone. It's possible that you had a, a, a predator that only had upper teeth that was going around the kind of like bark ball, but um, I doubt it. Um, the other thing that I think was a little compelling was somebody made a model of this and they put a mouthpiece on it. And when they did this and played it, this is what they heard. So that is a diatonic scale. So either that was one very talented saber-toothed tiger or the Neanderthals beat us to the diatonic scale, which I think is an, a remarkable idea. So this really raises the question, is music a universal human experience? Well, all cultures have it, that's one thing. It's usually the first thing you get to hear if you're an infant. Uh, mothers instinctively sing to their children when they're crying out um, or even when they're not. Some mothers sing better than others, if you know what I mean, but, uh, but nonetheless, they all do it. It's also um, part of our language and not just in the Western cultures or, or, or Asian cultures. Every culture does cer certain things vocally that are quite musical. One of them is when you call a name out across a distance, Doris, Freddy, or children on the playground, Nyan, 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 Nyan. We hear that everywhere on the planet, uh, no matter what culture you're from. Now, something that I've always found remarkable is that very simple patterns of music can be converted to signals with emotional content in them. In other words, uh, you hear just a, like a simple chord, not even a whole song, just a single chord, and you feel an emotional uh, reaction to it. Now, here in the West, um, if I play that C chord on the left, most people think of that as sort of an upbeat, happy little sound. But if I change that E to an E flat, well, now it's something more serious. So composers, of course, have taken advantage of this and tried to manipulate our, manipul our uh, emotions with that all, all through time. I'm going to give you an example of this. I'm going to play a little fragment of the second movement of Beethoven's seventh, and I'm going to use the opening chords more or less the same way. It's, it's going to be minor, but then I'm going to play it again with the major, and I'm just going to change the opening chord and leave the rest of it the same and see how, you, how it affects the meaning, the emotional meaning of the rest of the music. Okay, so that was the, the minor. Now I'm just gonna change that opening chord to the major, and again, leave everything else the same, and see what happens. Beethoven, who, by the way, is right here with me, um, is probably rolling over in his grave. In fact, maybe I should turn him down here just for the rest of the show. So I think that just is another example of how our brains just automatically react to these things. And probably without too much experience and musical experience, we have this emotional response to music. And there's lots of other examples, but uh, we don't have all night. So uh, I want to kind of move on to some other point I want to make which is how the brain interprets music. So 
we, uh, we know a lot of this now from what we call functional magnetic resonance imaging. This is an MRI where you're looking at more than just the structure, but we're using the idea from uh, what I told you before, that the astrocytes interact with the blood vessels and control how much blood is flowing when a nerve cell needs to fire. And so in the resting state, those blood vessels are gonna have a small diameter, and in the active state, those blood vessels are gonna have a large diameter. And so we can use that sort of as a readout, if you will, of brain activity in real time in an MRI machine. And what you see in this picture on the lower left there is a 3D reconstruction of a brain with areas mapped that light up when we just listen to music in an MRI machine. Now you're thinking to yourself, I know some of you have probably had an MRI and you're thinking, how do you do that? Well, you can actually get people to stay very still um, with their heads there and put noise canceling headphones and pipe music in um, and have people respond to it and then measure what happens. Um, so this is, this is something that we know. And by mapping these types of areas of the brain, we find that listening to music activates a lot of different areas. Areas involved in attention, in memory, in expectations and rules, and emotion. Now, some of you think, okay, well, attention, that makes sense. When we hear music, we always pipe up, right? And memory, well, we always have memories of things that we think about when we hear a song. And of course, emotion, we just talked about that. We can have our emotions really change when we hear uh, any kind of music. But what about this expectation and rules business? Well, if I were to play a, a scale for you, like this one, you would all know that the next note is this G. But what if I play this? Well, now your brain's going, no, 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 don't do that. Mm -hmm. so, so this is something that our brains are wired. We have, we have these expectations for how things should be happening. So one of the coolest questions I think that came out of uh, neuroscience studies on music recently, not that recently, but a few years ago, was the idea that maybe there are areas of our brain that are wired for music. And there was a study done using this fMRI procedure where they put people in these machines and they played a huge number of sounds to these people. Um, and so these sounds included flushing toilets and uh, a car accelerating and running water and breathing but also musical sounds. And so what they did was they categorized all of these different sounds and then mapped them to the brain. And what they found was that in fact, music mapped somewhat interestingly localized distinctly from language um, and other parts of sound uh, recognition. Those blue uh, little circles you see there on the right side and the left side of the brain in the auditory cortex light up in response to music, but not so much to other sounds. Now, this is kind of an interesting question. Okay, maybe there are circuits, if you will, that are specifically responding to music, but were they there when we were born? Or did those circuits develop over time um, as we experience music throughout our lives? And that's a question that still needs to be answered. So in all cultures, just listening to music can have a number of really interesting influences. It can enhance your intention, can alter your blood pressure, it can elicit strong memories, elicit very strong emotional responses, but it can also, importantly, influence your mood. And coming back to those questions about anxiety, uh, there's been many studies that have looked at this question. Now, I'm only gonna show you, uh, just kind of cite two of them here. There was one study in which they would look at people who are about to undergo very stressful experiences, and it was the same experience, and they found that listening to quiet instrumental music actually reduced cortisol levels, remember that, that stress hormone cortisol, uh, before that experience and helped them get through that experience. Um, there have also been many studies looking at how music could affect uh, patients' approach and stress levels going uh, into medical procedures. Um, and this is patients undergoing hemodialysis in that second study. They found that listening to either a combination of preferred music, in other words, music that people really liked and they could identify that they liked, um, or relaxing instrumental music, lower their cortisol and also uh, lower their stress levels and, and their, their feelings about going into those procedures. So how is that working? So think about our, 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 our vicious bear again. Um, if you have this vicious bear that you're dealing with, but maybe you've got your headphones on um, and you're listening to some great music, um, that's gonna possibly actually activate, it turns out, those areas in the prefrontal cortex uh, and that cingulate cortex that I mentioned before that mediate how the amygdala influences other pathways, including the release of hormones from the uh, hypothalamus that lead to cortisol. So 
this is a, a really interesting uh, finding that music activates these very areas that then uh, in turn turn on this sort of stress pathway, if you will, this anxiety pathway. Now, how does the brain make music? And can making music help you with anxiety? Um, well, it's hard to do studies on actual composition, the actual act of composing music. And I should say, coming back to the question of stress, for some people, composing music can be a very stressful experience, especially if you have a deadline. Um, for some people, it's a great way to release stress. Uh, but improvising is something that's been studied pretty clearly. And one of the coolest things about when you improvise music is that something happens that a little, was a little bit unexpected. Um, what you're seeing in this brain is a pianist laying in a MRI machine on their back with a keyboard that they can't even see, but they're improvising a song. And in the course of improvising, areas that become more active are turning red and areas that are becoming less active are turning blue. And what you're seeing is that the, the, a lot of the areas that with other activities, including listening to music, light up, are actually getting turned down or turned off. And that's really remarkable. And it's, it suggests something about sort of the idea that um, there may be inhibition that's driven by those activities, and now you're disinhibiting that activity and allowing yourself to be a little more creative. Consistent with that idea, um, there was a study done where someone was act, asked to compose under an MRI machine uh, based on a very simple structural uh, structure of music. And what you see on the right is the resting state. And this is actually looking at how different areas of the brain interact with each other, like sort of a network analysis, if you will. And what you're seeing on the right is all these areas that are highly connected to each other, but in the composing state, a lot of those connections break down and go away. So again, you're sort of turning things off to allow for creativity to happen. So what's interesting is there's been a few studies done, and this was one that I found that was pretty interesting, showing that, in fact, when you improvise music without any stressful guidelines and just being able to sit and relax, um, you can play tuned or untuned percussion instruments in particular in this particular study, but there's been a few other studies looking at um, more melodic instruments. And in the same, all of them, what they're finding is it actually increases your sense of psychological well-being, it increases relaxation, and it decreases cortisol, our buddy, the stress hormone. Um, and so I thought it'd be fun to um, show you something that I kind of came up with earlier today as an example of something to do when you want to relieve stress. And so this is, my stress song. sing again tonight, I promise. <laughs> so I think any stress song that you would like, you don't have to sing that one, obviously. Uh, but making up music is a great way to relieve stress. And you have, may have your own stress songs uh, that you play anyway, but uh, making up new ones is always uh, a great way to sort of get your mind off of things uh, and actually mm -hmm. possibly reduce cortisol. Now, what about just playing instruments, uh, playing in music or singing? Um, Think about what the brain does when you play a musical instrument. Well, look, let's look at a violinist here. So let's say you're reading music. So the photons are coming off the musical page. They're going into your eye. They're being, uh, turning on cells in your retina in the back of your eye. And those are now being projected. The information from those cells is being projected to the very back of your brain, to your visual cortex which then uh, kind of interprets some of that information and sends it to other parts of your brain, including your motor cortex, as an instruction for what note is about to be played or needs to be played. So that's a lot of information going back and forth in your brain right there. And of course, from the motor cortex, information has to go all the way down your arms, uh, into your hands, into your fingertips. And with one hand, you're moving a string, on the, on, and the, on the other, you're moving your bow, and they're doing different things. 
your uh, sensory organs in your fingertips and in your hands and your arms are telling you about the position, about the pressure, about the location, all that information. And it's going back up to your brain uh, and then being processed until the instruction for the next note comes along. And this is all happening, of course, incredibly fast, thanks to all that wonderful myelin. So playing a musical instrument, I would say, in some respects, is one of the most challenging thing a human brain can do. So can music practice or performance lead to the production of new nerve cells? Remember that process I talked about, neurogenesis. Now, when I was in school, we were told that um, you get a certain number of neurons, um, and then it's all downhill from there. And there's certainly days that I feel that way. Um, but in reality, it turns out we are capable of generating new neurons throughout life. And the first hint of this came in 1965. Um, investigators named Altman and Doss uh, discovered this in rats. And what they found was that rats um, actually, when they were under a learning, uh, doing some sort of learning, uh, that's a rat brain, by the way, not a turkey. Um, when you looked at a part of the brain called the hippocampus, they found evidence um, of new cells being formed in a part of the hippocampus hippocampus, it's called the subgranular zone um, in the dentate gyrus, which is that kind of blue area in the middle. Um, and they postulated that this was evidence that new neurons could develop um, in the adult brain. And uh, absolutely nobody believed this. This study was uh, just, you know, they kind of, I think it wound up being uh, uh, tossed in many garbage cans around the world. Now, having said that, um, some time went by and people started thinking about this question again. And then something really remarkable happened in 1978. First, uh, the 78 Stingray came out, which was a fantastic car. Um, the 78 model of the uh, uh, so Stingray bicycle came out and a really terrible movie called Stingray was released that year. It was a banner year for Stingrays, except for the Stingrays, of course, in this one laboratory uh, who are sacrificed to demonstrate that stingrays throughout their lives actually undergo neurogenesis. Now, this study was not really controversial. People thought this was really amazing and very interesting, but not very many people cared because after all, they were stingrays. Then people looked at other animal species and there's a number of studies done in birds and songbirds. Um, and there's a part of um, the, the song, songbird brain, the higher vocal center or HVC, and people started seeing evidence of neurogenesis there as well. Um, and in fact, there was some speculation that this might be really required for the learning of these new songs. And to make a long story short, what we now know is that adult neurogenesis actually proceeds even in the human brain. Um, it continues on when we're quite young, and then it really goes down. We have very, very low levels of neurogenesis in the adult brain. There have been some studies claiming that there's zero neurogenesis in the adult, adult brain, but more recent ones actually saying that there is. And what's more, it, it seems clear that this neurogenesis is really important for learning and memory and certain types of learning and memory uh, throughout life. So what's am amazing is that if you look at professional musicians versus non-musicians, and you look at um, functional activity data and also volumetric data, it appears that there's more going on in the hippocampus, this area where neurogenesis is happening in musicians compared to non-musicians, suggesting that in fact, music may be one way to drive this process. Now, what about other aspects that we talked about? So that was neurogenesis. What about myelination? Now remember, myelination uh, is all about having that increased uh, conduction velocity, that increased speed of nerve impulses on those axons. Um, so there's a study done looking at people who have a condition called amusia. Uh, this isn't just Uncle John who can't carry a tune. These are people who, when they hear music, they really have no perception of what they're listening to. And it turns out when you look at the brains of people with amusia, it turns out they lack myelin in certain areas that connect different areas of the brain to one another. So they have deficits in the parts of the brain where myelin is in the white matter. Um, and that really accounts for this lack of processing. Those particular fibers are stuck on I-5 at rush hour. Uh, they can't go on the autobahn so that you can appreciate the music. Now that's cool, but there was another study done looking at children who were taking musical lessons. And this has been done now in adults as well. And it's pretty clear that um, practicing music actually increases the amount of myelination in various different parts of the brain. Um, and this was a study done in children taking piano lessons compared to over time and uh, compared to children who were not taking similar lessons. 
Um, and it was a pretty remarkable finding, suggesting that myelin is a plastic thing, that it really, we can make more of it in the act of playing music. And what about my last thing, synaptic connectivity? Well, synapses, those connections that we make, we make them when we learn new things. Um, and we strengthen those synapses when we rehearse things. But over time, if we don't rehearse those things, some of those synapses do uh, break down. Also, they break down with aging. Um, and so it's interesting, as people have shown using um, uh, uh, motor evoked potentials, which is sort of a way to look at the activity uh, uh, that's driven by synapses, that musicians actually have much more of this activity uh, than non-musicians. And again, we're talking about professional musicians, so people who are doing it all the time. So that's pretty remarkable. So I would like to um, get everybody to do a little music right now. Um, and uh, my, my daughter Claire is going to sing with me. Uh, actually, I promised I won't sing, so I'll let her sing. Um, and we'd like to start everybody off by uh, beating a drum. And I think we have a few drummers in the room here. Um, if everybody has a drum handy, uh, grab it right now, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna start a beat going, and we're gonna do a little um, tribute to Bill Withers, um, who just passed away, um, uh, and a little song that, that I love of his, um, and just we'll start with that beat going. So let's go with the beat. Thank you, Claire. I hope everybody got some drumming in there. Drumming is very therapeutic, uh, and uh, anytime you can participate and play an instrument, uh, we know that it can reduce stress, um, it can lower anxiety and lower that cortisone. Of course, it's depending on if you're in a stressful situation. So if you're actually nervous about playing, uh, those effects might go away. So if it's something you're doing and you're enjoying it, it's a very positive experience. Now, what's interesting is even better would be playing with people, which I know right now is hard, but if you can get some neighbors to do some like cross property uh, concerts or just have a lot of people in your home by chance who also are musical, it turns out that singing music or playing in groups can increase endorphins, which is another molecule that actually relieves pain and relieves stress. Uh, it increases dopamine, which I mentioned before, which has been part of that reward signaling. And the combination of these effects does two things. It actually increases your sense of belonging to a group, and it increases your acceptance of members in a group. So I hope that that was an interesting uh, talk, an interesting uh, performance. 
uh, we did the best we could. I hope I hope it wasn't too awful. Um, but uh, I hope, also hope that um, everything we've just talked to you about will help you understand that doing something like playing music is a great way to stimulate processes like neurogenesis and synaptogenesis and myelination in your brain. And it also can help you relieve some of that anxiety you might be feeling right now. So thanks again. Um, and I think Amanda is going to uh, uh, check into some questions from you all. Yeah, I'm, I'm online, um, Scott. Are we, ah, there we are. Okay, can you see me? Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Um, so thank you. And uh, well, there was a comment on there to say thank you to Claire, it was lovely. So I just thought I would pass that along. Um, so we have several questions. Um, I want to start with one you mentioned um, <laughs> about uh, playing together and, and drum circles. Is there any kind of uh, does it need to be melodic or is it just the, the fact that you're in a group together doing a thing or what's the best way to do that? So I, I, oh, you turn that off. We got a little echo here. Hang on a second. Just turn your volume off on the computer. Just one second. Um, is that better? I think yeah. that's better. Okay. So um, in answer to that question, uh, so the you don't need to have a melodic music. In fact, a, a basic drum circle with just a bunch of rhythm is a great way to do something. And for that matter, just sitting and banging a drum on your own uh, is a great thing. Make up drum, drum rhythms and drum songs. You can actually get a little bit of melody out of a drum if you do it right. So uh, it doesn't matter if it's melodic or not. Uh, it, the main thing is if you wanna lower your anxiety, of course, the most important thing is that it's fun and you're enjoying it. It's not a stressful experience. Not like, you know, standing up in front of a bunch of people and, and doing it for the first time. What, what's that like? <laughs> no idea, no idea. Um, so there's been a, a number of questions about patients with Parkinson's and, and there's musical therapy that is used with Parkinson's and, and wondering if you could talk about that and, and why that's effective or if it is or not. If you have any information on that, that'd be useful. Yeah, there's a growing literature showing that music therapy is helpful for Parkinson's patients, especially at certain stages of disease. Um, uh, there's a, a really nice uh, therapy that's been uh, shown to be quite effective where people go dancing um, and they actually um, put on music with specific rhythms to try to train those rhythms, which sometimes Parkinson's patients, the real issue is getting a motor sequence going. And so once you get that rhythm going, they can go out and dance and move. Um, and that's been very helpful. I can say that um, a couple of years ago, I had the honor of listening to um, a group of Parkinson's patients who were in a band. And the band was called the Tremble Clefs, which I thought was a great name. Um, and uh, the Tremble Clefs were fantastic. And they all told me that they practiced sometimes hours a day, but they insist that that practice kind of helps them and they feel like it's kind of slowing down the progression of, of, of their illness. Okay. Um, is there any, uh, do you get benefit from just listening to music or do you have to play music or is it, um, you know, as far as anxiety, uh, what's the best way to do that? So listening to music itself can help with anxiety and stress, no question about it. Um, of course, it depends on the music. Um, uh, some people uh, don't like jazz. I personally like jazz, but some people when they listen to jazz, it makes them more stressed out, I think. Um, there are studies showing that uh, in some places in malls that you actually use uh, atonal classical music in particular or kind of very loud operas to keep certain uh, groups of people away from stores. So that's, that's obviously not what you wanna to listen to. Uh, what you should be listening to are, is types of music that you find relaxing, uh, help you focus or that you enjoy. Um, but all those studies I mentioned about cortisol going down, that was just listening to music. In terms of the other things I talked about, uh, neurogenesis and myelin formation and synaptogenesis, it turns out you have to work a little harder for that. Um, so that, those types of processes actually require you to learn motor, sensory, cognitive, all those things together to really get that kind of benefit. Um, all the studies that have been done so far really suggest that you have to really push yourself to do something new, something outside of the box to get that kind of uh, change. 
I'm looking down here reading the questions that are, are being fed to me. Um, I have some questions about uh, music in tonal languages. And the, the example was given was Welsh, but I know Chinese also um, has uh, tonal qualities to it. Is there any information about how language and music work together in that way? Well, so that's uh, kind of what I was talking about a little bit earlier. Um, I mean, the fact that we combine lyrics often with these tonal patterns and it helps us with memory, that's for sure well demonstrated. Um, but uh, interestingly, yeah, certain languages are more um, melodic, if you will. Uh, they use a much broader tonal range than our language, which probably sounds pretty boring to them. Um, and interestingly, people who have uh, early life experiences with those languages, and even later, um, are more likely to have things like perfect pitch. Um, and I think it's because they need to be able to hear subtle differences in meaning that are, are affiliated with those, those very subtle changes in tone. Do you have any information or perhaps opinions on how uh, this taking music out of K-12 you know, programs, that sort of thing might affect people and, and students and their anxiety? Oh, that's a really great question. I mean, I think it's a, a criminal act to take art and music out of um, K through 12 uh, uh, settings. I think uh, the, the sooner we get exposure to this as human beings, the better. I mean, it, uh, the fact that we actually have areas in our brain that become wired and, and attuned to music, I think is an attestation to that. Um, it's important that we have early musical experiences and art experiences. And it's helping with so many aspects of our brain development, learning perseverance, learning focus, all of these things. Um, in terms of anxiety, it's a great question. I think that's not been well looked at in children and how uh, programs where they have an opportunity to experience music versus not, if those kids tend to have more issues with anxiety or just fearfulness in general. It's a great question, but I don't know of any studies that have actually clearly looked at that. We've had a couple of questions about um, genres of music, and, and this one made me kind of laugh. Said, uh, Dr. Sherman, I'm a med student. Why do I have to listen to 90s gangster rap while studying cadavers slash anatomy to understand anything? Why is my playlist completely dependent on what I'm studying? Yeah, have any thoughts about that? You know, um, it'd be interesting to uh, go back and, and repeat gross anatomy and, and listen to gangster rap instead of what I was listening to. It might have helped, I don't know. I think it's, it's really what puts your, your mind in the state that works for you. Um, and again, that may be very different for different people. Um, I can tell you that if you're trying to study for an exam, you probably do not want to be listening to music that has lyrics that are going to get you singing along or distracting you in any way. Uh, you're, if you listen to sort of music in the background that's not doing those things, that's not distracting you, that can actually activate your brain and attention. But if you, uh, if you do something that's pulling your attention away, and what makes you want to get up and dance and uh, uh, or cry or sing out, you're probably not going to get a lot of studying done. Um, the, another question about uh, is singing slash vocal study, uh, is that different impact than playing a physical instrument like a piano? Um, it, since it involves body producing the sound, I would assume that the power of singing is actually stronger than a physical instrument. Any thoughts about that? It depends on what, you're, what question you're asking. So if you're asking about the things I mentioned regarding changes in the brain, like neurogenesis and synaptogenesis, singing, um, I mean, yeah, professional singers in particular get to a point where uh, they're controlling their vocal cords in pretty remarkable ways. And you think about an opera singer um, and the breathing and everything else you have to be doing and coordinating. Um, but it, you're not doing other fine and gross motor things at the same time uh, that other instruments would require like a piano or a guitar or a violin or any, any answer or even drums. And so I think um, the studies that have been done so far suggest that while singing does have a lot of those effects, uh, instrumental music goes a little further. Now having said that, uh, I did mention that study about singing in groups like choirs and their effects on uh, uh, endorphins and dopamine and, and how that can affect just a sense of belonging and everything else. Singing seems a little more powerful in that exa example and instrumental music, although being in a big band also helps. And it's, it's interesting in those studies, the singing, the bigger the group, the better. So the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, you're gonna get a great effect there. If it's just you and three friends, maybe a barbershop shop quartet, you'll get an effect that won't be as strong. 
Yeah, I know when we have done a related event, the music and the aging brain in, in theaters, when we could all be around each other, when we've done a sing along, that's been a really powerful experience to get, you know, 600 people singing in a room together. So it's pretty Yeah, cool. so if, if none of you have ever done that, um, I'm hoping we'll be able to do that again live. Please come and we'll have a great sing along and talk more about that. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll try and do that as soon as we can. Um, so related to that, there's a, a question about, does singing affect anxiety by teaching self-regulation of breath? Can you run that by me again? Sure. Um, singing uh, as, a, as a way to learn how to control your breathing and regulate anxiety related to that. Do you have any information on that? I mean, I think there are techniques that people use in music therapy where that's exactly um, what people are doing. They're trying to help you control things like breathing and, and everything else. And, and that's actually, when you learn to sing, part of what you're doing is learning to control your breath, uh, learning to control how you exhale and all these other things that are really important for becoming a good, powerful singer. So yes, I think music therapy definitely involves that depending on what you're aiming for in therapy. Um, and I have a number of uh, great uh, colleagues who are musical therapists who um, I'm sure would be happy to talk about that. Maybe we can get another science on tap on that question. Um, another question that I, I, I realize is said in seriousness, but I, I can relate and I think it's a little amusing is, uh, don't you find that stress really raises when you hear or play music that is not as it should be, like out of tune or not well performed? Uh, I have a hard time when I hear something that I have, that I have heard done well and then done poorly, uh, have a hard time at, with that not affecting me negatively. Is that part of the, uh, the expectation thing you were talking about? Yeah, and I, I hope um, my playing on Eight on Sunshine didn't uh, cause that stressful response for you. Um, I feel the same way. If I hear um, music that I really love and I, it's played, even if it's not played uh, badly, but played in a way that I just feel the style is wrong. People, you know, they, they have their own ways of doing things. I'll hear something and it's, it's kind of a negative reaction, right? And so I think, we all have that to a degree. We want to hear things, we have, and that is part of the expectation in the rule center. We have an expectation for what the next note is and how it's going to be played, how it's going to be sustained, all those other aspects of, of the musical sound. Okay, so um, with that, any last things you want to add about uh, music and anxiety and how to, to uh, help mitigate anxiety feelings these days? Well, I, I would suggest everybody do what works for them. Um, if you can get out and sing a little bit or just listen to some of your favorite music and enjoy the sunshine, um, please do it because it does help. Um, if you've never played an instrument and you might have a little bit of fun doing it, pick something up and try it. Uh, if you have people you're stuck in the house with who might drive crazy, maybe find an instrument with headphones. But uh, you know, overall, I think uh, anything you can do uh, it's, as I mentioned, all these studies suggest that any aspect of music you engage in has a chance to help you so long as you uh, find it enjoyable, so. Well, fantastic. And uh, I think with that, we will say thank you to Dr. Larry Sherman for joining us this evening. I appreciate your, your time and your expertise and your piano playing. And thank you as well, Claire, for, for joining us. And thank you, everybody. For those of you who actually gave up your Seder tonight to listen to this, happy Passover. Um, my love to everybody, and please stay safe. Thanks. And I'm going to share my screen again, hopefully. And, um, whoops. Okay, so thank you all for joining us. I'm sorry about the uh, technical difficulties, but um, we'll hopefully... Uh, we tested it yesterday and it was fine, so we'll, uh, we'll make sure it's better for next time. Speaking of which, the next event will be next Thursday night, again, 7 p.m. Pacific, um, on oxytocin, the science behind the most sensationalized hormone with Dr. Randy Hutter Epstein, who is a lecturer at Yale University and is also, also the author of Aroused, the History of Hormones and How They Control Just About Everything. And Randy came and uh, spoke at one of our events a couple of years ago and was fantastic. And so I'm, I'm excited to get her back um, on, our, on our virtual stage. So come join us next week to find out about that. 
And then I also want to mention, hold on, there we are. Um, so we have just started a Patreon page. Um, we are working with our nonprofit partner, which is an organization called Make You Think. And um, the, the money that we're going to be raising through Patreon is going to be helping produce more of these programs. Um, and one of the issues that we had this evening was that we hit a, a we had paid for an extra amount for the, the Zoom um, uh, I, conference and um, we we had a certain number of people that we could invite and then we hit that level that that uh, maximum because Facebook wouldn't let us do it and so if we want to make it uh, more available to more people we need more money um, so I know that there are a lot of people hurting and I don't want to put any undue stress on anyone um, so if you are able if you find what we're doing um, important and you are able even five bucks a month is a huge help to us. So I really appreciate it. And uh, cause, because we wanna make these free to everyone while we're all getting through this thing. So thank you all for coming um, and I hope to see you next week. So have a fabulous evening and stay safe. Good night.